Please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for our children. Thank you for calling us your friends, your brothers and sisters. Help us to serve you with the joy that the minions do and that our children do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's no secret, we have a wedding today. On a Sunday. Mary Leary and David Billing. And I like it for so many reasons. But it is fun. And it's different to have a wedding on a Sunday morning. Did you bring a gift? Ha, <laughs> ha, just tricking you. <laughs> the answer to that really is yes. Because you've already given it. And now we're going to see if it's the gift that keeps on giving. Because I looked at you all, I really did, and asked you, will you do all in your power to uphold these two persons in their marriage? And without a doubt, you said, we will. It's a gift that keeps on giving. We'll be looking for it. One of the tasks that I have and enjoy in preparing a couple for their wedding ceremony is to lead them in choosing lessons to be read for their wedding ceremony. But today's lessons are the ones that were already scheduled to be read today 30, 40 years ago. For today, wedding or no. And I commend them to you. They fit. Go figure. The first one gives us a picture of the people of God gathered together near the end of Joshua's life. This passage is referred to as the covenant at Shechem. You could call it a a bit of a marriage ceremony. They were already the people of the covenant, but before Joshua dies, he wants them to look at it a little differently. Instead of the covenant being like an overarching symbol of God's goodwill to them, kind of like the sun coming up in the morning, he challenges their hearts. God may have chosen you, But you choose this day who you will serve. The people give the easy answer. We will serve the Lord. But Joshua will not accept an easy answer. This is a life and death decision. And he looks at them and says, I don't think you can serve the Lord. Can you imagine when they come up a little bit later? And they make their vow. I look at them and say, you don't really mean that. We'll see what the people here do. The people swallowed deep and said, no, we will serve the Lord. Very well, Joshua said. Put away your foreign gods and idols and incline your hearts to God. Not bad for a wedding reading. Choose this day who you will be faithful to. Don't make it a flippant decision. Marriage isn't easy these days. There are lots of distractions. Put away all those distractions. Incline your hearts to each other. Make this covenant real. God does. The last two readings, they're like more like the everyday kind of parts of it. They speak to us about time and about delay. The church is close to beginning the church year. It's called Advent. And we face the fact that Jesus has not returned yet. And we wait. Sometimes marriage is like waiting for Jesus to return. We wait. There are times of great joy. And then there is the Every day, how do we live in the every day? Well, in our second reading, Paul is writing to the church, which had expressed concern for those who had died before Jesus returned. What happens to them? And he answers them by telling them a little bit about what happens right before the big wedding banquet. The banquet when Jesus returns. Our nickname for it is the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Good reading for today. We're all going to meet him in the air and escort him the rest of the way to the marriage feast, like the ten bridesmaids were supposed to be doing. In the meantime, encourage each other. That's what Paul says to them. Encourage each other because we have hope. So how are the two of you going to live your life together? Well, in the meantime, encourage each other. When they're in need, those of you who made that commitment with the we will, we will encourage them. How will all of us live as we wait for the return of our Lord? We will encourage each other. Jesus then teaches us by telling us that parable of the kingdom of heaven. Ten bridesmaids. You didn't have ten. They took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. David, when you arrived this morning, did the bridesmaids greet you? No, I didn't think so. (laughs) Bold brides let this reading be the gospel lesson for their wedding. Five of the bridesmaids were foolish. And five of them were wise. This parable is about wise living versus foolish living as we, men and women, wait for Jesus to return. In our story, five of the bridesmaids took extra oil for their lamp, and five did not. Unlike today, the groom was late. They all fell asleep in their waiting. And of course, the groom arrives when he arrives, and the wise bridesmaids were ready. Some people live their lives like they don't think Jesus will ever return. They let their faith grow cold. For them, it doesn't really matter if they are obedient in following the example of Jesus. They don't anticipate his return. And so his mission doesn't matter. They don't really love their neighbors as themselves. You hear the kids loving people or really loving. They get it. And you know, sometimes we don't love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And yet each day gives us multiple opportunities for exp- to express love in concrete ways. Each moment offers our hearts the chance to decide on either a closed world or an open kingdom authored by God himself. Some folks enter marriage like the foolish bridesmaids, men and women alike, not prepared for the long haul. The wise ones take care of today and are ready for tomorrow. When I talked to the two of you, I heard really good perspective of what's gone before and really good perspective of what's to come and about how to live into that. And um, we'll be going before God with great confidence. They are prepared for dry spells. And we get to ask ourselves this day if we're ready for dry spells. Do we have enough oil and resources to weather the storms of our relationships? The wise bridesmaids, their lamp continues to burn even when around them the last spark seems invisible and there's little light. They're holding on for that long term because they have hope. You could say, as we think about the party to come, that the prophets of the Old Testament set the table for John the Baptist. John the Baptist set the table for Jesus. Jesus invites us to help set the table for the wedding banquet. It is a joyous occasion. And when we are about the work of setting the table, others will see us and say, see how they love each other. They won't say, see how they believe right. See how they march for this or that. See how they wear green and gold. (laughs) 
sorry. That's not what he's going to say. He will say, see how they love each other. Jesus wants the people of St. Thomas to live in such a way that people say about St. Thomas, see how they love each other. He wants people to say about Mary and David, see how they love each other. When others see how they love each other, when others see how we love each other, they will know that the Father sent Jesus. And they will know that they are invited to the wedding banquet. That's how they get their invitation. That's how we experience joy. That's how you will experience joy. Encouraging each other and loving each other and letting that love be an example to all. That's how it is for us in the church, whether you're from St. Thomas, another church, or considering church. How we love and encourage each other is how people will know Jesus. And that's our joy and yours. Amen.